So chapter six is going to be on lipids or the condensed energy. So approximately 70% of Americans consume more saturated fat than is recommended in the dietary guidelines and 70 to 75% consume less oil than is recommended. The functions of fatty acids are going to be in table 6.1. That's on page 101. The added fats and oils are going to provide more calories in the average American um, diet than any other food group. So this is really the part where if you start paying attention to fats and oils in the diet, you can really cut calories quickly and easily. Between 2000 and 2010, total fat intake remained at a high level with a slight increase in fats provided by vegetable oils and a decrease in consumption of saturated fats, principally due to trans fats. So uh, as they started to change those nutritional facts um, and forced consumers, not consumers, um, uh, manufacturers to publish how many trans fats were in it and to um, uh, give saturated and trans like their own little category in that um, and consumers began to be more educated on the dangers of um, diets that were high in saturated and trans fats then we began to see that uh, decrease in consumption so um, as those consumers are becoming more aware of healthy food choices um, making changes to an eating pattern is actually really difficult So uh, fat, the word fats, should actually be called lipids. Lipids have the same carbon makeup as do carbohydrates. They are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. However, they have less oxygen in them compared to carbon and hydrogen, so they are um, higher in calorie. Lipids contain less oxygen in proportion to hydrogen and carbon than carbohydrates do. Um, and then, of course, we have the two classes of the water insoluble substances. So we have our simple lipids, our triglycerides, which we learned a lot about in chapter two, and those occur in food and in the body. And then we have structural lipids, and those are made by our bodies for very specific functions. We'll talk about what each of those are. Triglycerides, those are the ones with one or more fatty acids. We'll talk about those um, with that carbohydrate, phosphate, and nitrogenous compounds, um, which are called compound lipids. So you might remember from chapter two, they have the glycerol, and when one fatty acid is attached to it, it's called a monoglyceride. When there are two fatty acids attached to the glycerol, it's a diglyceride. And when three, of course, we have what we know um, as a triglyceride. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the fatty acid chain is a chain of carbon atoms that are attached to the hydrogen atoms with an acid grouping on one end, just like we talked about in chapter two. So if you are not really sure about triglycerides, and as you're reading more, if you're still like, hmm, what is that, go back to chapter two. Um, here we're also talking about the short chain fatty acids, medium chain and long chain fatty acids. So short have less than six carbon atoms. So, I mean, we know carbohydrates have six, right? So this is pretty similar, except, you know, it's not the same. <laughs> and then um, medium chain fatty acids contain anywhere from six to 10 and long chain fatty acids contain 12 or more. Uh, and you can look in your book and uh, figure 6.1. And then figure 6.2 is where the book starts to talk about the digestion process of lipids specifically. So lipids start in the mouth, they get broken up by our teeth, obviously, um, and moistened, and we form that bolus. It is swallowed, goes down to the stomach where it churns and mixes and further breaks down the food. Um, our liver produces the bile, the gallbladder stores and secretes our bile. Uh, the pancreas is going to produce uh, pancreatic lipase. That's in, lipase is important for breaking down lipids, right? Small intestine um, it does a whole lot of things here. You're going to have to turn to page 103 to read that. The large intestine partially digests 
um, and undigested lipids become part of fecal material and then they are excreted. So fatty acids are classified according to their degree of saturation. It wasn't going to go away. Remember the single bonds and double bonds? It's not, not gone yet. So saturated fatty acids or SFAs contain only single bonds. So um, every single carbon is got two hydrogens attached to it. Um, when the adjacent carbon atoms are joined by a double bond because there's two hydrogen atoms where there's like no carbon, right? Then there's, there's a double bond there. There's a gap between the hydrogen atoms in that chain and that's called an unsaturated fatty acids. We are looking for double bonds. That's what we want in our unsaturated fatty acids. The monounsaturated fatty acids only have one double bond, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, you know, the polyunsaturated fatty acids would have more than one double bond. Um, so trans and polyunsaturated fatty acids, so that hydrogenation process where we are processing the vegetable oil, that is going to uh, change the shape of the um, molecule, and it's going to make it to where um, the atoms are sitting on opposite sides instead of on the same sides, and that is what is going to give us a trans fatty acid because they're not on the same side. If they are a cis fatty acid, they're on the same, right? We remember this from chapter two. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, or I'm going to lovingly refer to them from now on as PUFAs, those are going to be omega-6 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids. You guys are probably pretty familiar with omega-3. It's a lot of hype, but omega-6 is like it's a older, less popular brother. So partial hydrogenation results in large number of fatty acids having that altered shape, right? A common trans fatty acid is um, elatic acid. It's a naturally occurring fatty acid in uh, in some foods, it's really not that uh, that prominent. Um, we also need to start talking about the types of fatty acids here. So we have um, linolenic acid, right? And we have linoleic acid. So every time we see this as we go through this chapter, I'm going to over pronounce these words because they are so close and it's very easy to mix them up. So uh, just so you know, that's what's going to happen. Omega-3 fatty acids or alpha-linolenic acid. Um, and it's going to be different from linoleic acid and arachnodonic acid are those polyunsaturated fatty acids, the PUFAs, right? So uh, linoleic acid is a PUFA and linolenic acid acid is an omega-3. So those characteristics of fatty acids, we know that saturated fatty acids are going to be solid at room temperature. These are typically animal fats um, and coconut oil and palm oil and palm kernel. They are solids at room temperatures. Short chain fatty acids, MUFAs and PUFAs, that are liquid at room temperature are called oil, right? They're not called fats, they're called oils. Milk fat contains a large number of short chain uh, saturated fatty acids and um, fats with a high proportion of unsaturated fatty acids may deteriorate or become rancid when subjected to high temperatures and light, right? So this is why you can smell your milk uh, to try to figure out if it's still good for you, right? Um, sometimes with items like this, they will add in vitamin E in order to, um, well, vitamin E is an antioxidant, right? It's going to prevent some of that oxidation and that deterioration of those molecules. And it's nice because it will make whatever the product is last longer, but once the vitamin E is added into the product, we can't use it in our body anymore. We're not absorbing vitamin E for vitamin E properties. Phospholipids. This is one of the few words I actually remember from like eighth grade science was phospholipid layer of, uh, of cells. But anyway, 
Phospholipids, they contain phosphorus and a nitrogenous base in addition to fatty acids and glycerol. They are important in fat absorption and the transport of fats in the blood, right? So they uh, run around in lipoproteins, but anyway. Um, uh, lecithin, lecithin, I think it is, is the most widely distributed phospholipid. Um, and they are making supplements now, but um, it's unsure whether that's going to reduce the risk of atherosclerosis. That's what they're marketing them for, but might not work out. Um, and then cephalin is present in thromboplastin, which is necessary for blood clotting, right? Um, there's also sphenogomyelins, which is a constituent of brain tissue and the myelin sheath that is around all of our nerve fibers. Um, that was probably one of the biggest things I took from dental hygiene nutrition course was that, um, I, mean, I mean, I really care about the myelin sheath that's around all of my nerve fibers because if I'm going to work so hard to try to learn something, I want to be able to remember it for longer. So um, it's important to eat fats so that you can hold on to that uh, sphenogomyelins um, and, and build that myelin sheath. But um, the book is telling you that you can go to uh, the Evolve site if you wanted to learn more about that biochemistry of phospholipids. Um, I probably would more so recommend that you go to YouTube because uh, you can learn everything on YouTube. This is, that's where I put this video. Moving on to lipoproteins. So they are produced by our body and they are are done so so that they can transport insoluble fats through the blood. So we talked about this in chapter two. Um, we remember that most of the fats that we have in our system, um, our cholesterols, our triglycerides, all of that is going to be hydrophobic. It means it is not soluble in water. It means it doesn't travel easily through water. Um, it doesn't mix, right? Water and oil, they don't mix. So. Uh, we need a lipoprotein to come along as like a little little taxi through the blood vessels and carry those triglycerides and um, and our cholesterols and things like that through the bloodstream. So lipoproteins ca uh, produce they're produced by your body to transport insoluble fats. Compound lipids composed of triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol uh, combined with protein. That's how we make lipoproteins. And then there are four different types of lipoproteins present in our blood system. They are, you'll probably recognize them from the acronyms, but they are high density lipoproteins or HDLs. We have low density lipoproteins or LDLs. And we also have very low density lipoproteins or VLDLs. This is especially bad right? Um, and then we have chylomicrons, which um, I haven't really ever heard of before this book. So that was interesting. Uh, your book doesn't really talk about them a whole lot. So um, yeah, you can look in your book to figure 6.4, which is at the bottom of page 104. It does go into um, the group of that, how much of it is made up of cholesterol, how much is made of protein, how much is made up of triglyceride, all of that wonderful stuff there. Um, the phospholipids in lipoproteins are present in approximately the same proportions in all individuals. So everyone's making these lipoproteins at, they're, pr they're pretty much the same. They're not like, you know, how your, everyone's DNA is different and everyone has like, you know, different ways of putting things together. And we all have like different muscles and things like that. Like it's not, it's not like that. So uh, everyone's pretty much making the same exact cells. I think it's pretty funny that cholesterol plays such a huge role in like cardiovascular disease. And uh, it gets this tiny, tiny little paragraph in your book on page 105. Um, so cholesterol is a fat-like sort of waxy substance. Um, and it is made by your body. You don't have to eat it at, at all. It's You don't have to intake it because your body makes all that you need. And sometimes your body even makes more than what you need. Um, 
It has important functions though, because it is a constituent of the brain. It's a part of your nervous tissue. It's a part of your bile salts. Um, it's a precursor for vitamin D and your steroid hormones. Um, and it is a structural component of cell membranes and teeth. So, I mean, while we want to reduce the bad cholesterol in our body, we still want to improve the, the good cholesterol in our body because cholesterol is, is actually an important it has an important function in our systems. Moving on to the physiological roles of lipids. So first and foremost, they do provide energy. It's a very calorie dense food, right? Because it has less oxygen and more hydrogen and carbon. And um, it's high in, I'm sorry, calorie dense foods are high in fat and low in vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. Um, so, uh, lipids have nine calories per gram. Okay, so you'll remember from the carbohydrate chapter and the protein chapter, they have four grams per, I'm sorry, four calories per gram. The uh, fat has nine calories per gram. So it is much more calorie dense. What is nice as well about the energy, because it can produce so much energy, it is also considered to be protein sparing, just like our carbohydrates were, fats are protein sparing. So um, we wanna be able to consume enough fats and have a fat storage so that we don't use our protein as our energy source because our protein has other more important things to do. Um, the next is satiety value. So fats have a higher satiety value than carbs and proteins because they end up taking longer for us to break them down. They're more complex, right? So they keep us full for longer, which is, is good. Um, and then they have a high palatability. So we are, uh, you know, we're engineered basically from surviving and is through survival, um, we need to eat foods that will keep us alive for longer, right? So we have evolved um, into, you know, enjoying the taste of things that will help us survive for a long time. Um, and so um, people will typically uh, develop a preference for these high fat foods pretty early on um, as children as they are introduced to them and it, they're going to persist through adulthood and you know kind of like once you're you enjoy the food it's kind of hard to uh, miss it then it has complementary relationships so there is fat soluble vitamins um, and essential fatty acids are generally found in foods containing fat. Linoleic acid cannot be synthesized in your body and it has to be supplied through dietary sources. So some of the best sources for linoleic acid are in polyunsaturated fats or PUFAs um, and they are found in vegetable oils like sunflower and safflower oil, soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, as well as nuts and seeds. So uh, the best sources of, of uh, linoleic acid are going to be nuts and seeds. Um, as far as fat storage goes, actually, you know what, let me back up and go back to complementary relationships. So we also have um, linolenic acid, right, which is found in flax seeds, um, and, and in oils, it's found in tofu and walnuts and things like that. Um, so linoleic acid, you cannot produce, you have to eat it. Linolenic acid is one of those essential fatty acids that is going to have a protective factor against heart disease. So the more like flax seeds and flaxseed oil, um, tofu, walnuts, um, walnut oil, pumpkin seeds, those kinds of things, the more of those foods you can eat, the more protective uh, or you know, up to a certain extent, um, as long as you stay within your caloric range um, of protective against heart disease. And then fat storage. Um, so 
fat, eating fat does, of course, if you uh, consume more fat than what you burn, then it will uh, contribute to adipose tissue or body fat. And it has a couple of roles. So it's going to provide a concentrated energy source, right? Anytime you are um, severely short of energy, you will use fat to survive. And um, it's kind of amazing because people can go, uh, it says up to 30 to 40 days with only water, uh, as long as you have some body fat. And then uh, the next one is protection of organs. So fatty tissue does surround your vital organs and provide a cushion and it will protect them from like traumatic injury. And then insulation as well. So um, people who have the you know, appropriate amount of body fat, um, it will hold on to some of their body heat. Um, but then if you have excessive layers of fat, it can also kind of like overheat you and prevent you from um, releasing heat in the summertime. Um, you can find some of this information in box 6.1 as to the health effects of that omega-3 fatty acids of, as far as the uh, protective against heart disease kind of thing. Okay, so as far as as hygienists, what do we know, need to know about fats? Uh, well, they are important for our oral health uh, and they're incorporated into the tooth structure. So we need fat in order to, um, you know, grow teeth when we're uh, in utero. And then dietary fats, they probably have more of a local uh, protection than a systemic influence. So um, the idea here is that, um, you know, the, the fats that are in your mouth as you're chewing will uh, hopefully kind of buffer some of that carbohydrate acid producing sort of uh, system. And then long chain fatty acids may reduce the dissolution of hydroxyapatite by acids. Um, we need more research there. Oral food retention is reduced, right? So when you, know, when you eat foods that have some type of oil or uh, fat, usually they're a little bit more slippery, right? They're not um, as sticky as some carbohydrates are. And then dietary fats will delay gastric emptying, right? Uh, which is, I, I think, without the rest of the sentence in your book is kind of you're like, that has nothing to do with my teeth. But um, what it's going to do is enhance fluoride absorption. As If it keeps the food in your stomach for longer, then you'll be able to absorb the fluoride better. And then that will have an overall um, better effect on your teeth. Uh, the idea here is that periodontal health may be promoted by reducing saturated fat intake and increasing uh, MUFAs and PUFAs. Um, the idea there is, has a lot to do with coincidental um, research. There is a correlational, but again, remember we talked uh, in previous lectures that correlation doesn't mean causation, right? So we don't necessarily know that because some of that bacteria um, is present in the arterial walls, we don't necessarily know that that is causing arterial um, hardening or atherosclerosis. So uh, the bacterial inflammation and systemic immune response, they are believed to play a central role in the initiation and propagation of atherosclerosis, but we don't know for sure. And then cardiovascular disease is a condition which of course affects the heart and the blood vessels. And then the bacteria from dental plaque biofilm can cause blood clots, right? Uh, and then the omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish is, oh, this is kind of random. Um, omega-3 fatty acids from fish are more effective than supplements. So the um, backing up a little bit to uh, above that, I don't know why these are in the same sense, in the same paragraph. The research studies show that the inflammatory process can be attenuated by that N3 fatty acids, uh, but they really need to do more research as far as like causational uh, kinds of research. We, do, we just have, you know, uh, correlational. And then the established link, uh, they established a link, not a cause and effect relationship. Um, but yes, so the, um, I've actually read a couple of research studies that say that most supplements 
don't really work that well. That if, if you can uh, get whatever the nutrient is from your food, you will hands down always absorb it better than you do if you take a supplement. So, um, yeah. So referring to box 6.2, it has a way to calculate how much um, fat should be in your diet. Um, and of course, with this, we're referring to that AMDR, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. The AMDR for fat is between 20% to 35% of the energy intake for adults. So it looks like for someone who um, needs 2000 calories a day, you would times that by 0.35, which is 35%, and that would give you 700 calories. Then you would divide that by nine because nine is the number of calories per uh, one gram of fat. And so then if you were eating 2000 calories a day, you would need, um, well, I don't know why it has the little less than symbol, but you would need 78 grams um, of fat per day. So uh, the recommendation here is to increase the number of oil that you eat and reduce the number of fat that you eat. And then uh, to keep intake of saturated fat, trans fat, and dietary cholesterol as low as possible while still consuming a nutritionally adequate diet. So, you know, they're not recommending that you completely reduce, you completely get rid of them. They're just saying to keep them as low as possible. And then that adequate intake or AI for linoleic acid is going to be 0.6% of energy intake, which is 17 grams a day for men and 12 grams a day for women, uh, 19 to 50 and 14 and 11 for women and men over 50. All right, so um, for sources of lipids, um, you're going to turn the page there to 108, and you're gonna look here at figure 6.5, which is at the top of the page, um, and it has all of those sources of the solid fats and oils. Um, and then if you look at table 6.2, down at the bottom of that, um, it's going to give you that itemized selected animal products containing saturated fats, multi, uh, I'm sorry, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, so MUFAs and PUFAs. Um, so the dietary guidelines will emphasize that rather than attempting to reduce fat intake, we should actually just focus on reducing our calories and having a less saturated fat, okay? So the idea is that if you just, instead of like um, you know, I need to eat less of whatever, you focus on what I should eat. So it's about, you know, I'm going to eat an avocado with this meal instead of eating whatever fried thing it was, right? Um, the principal sources of fat in the U.S. diet come from fats and oils, and then red meats, poultry and fish, and dairy products. Um, almost 80% of all vegetable oil consumed in the United States is soybean oil. This is because soybeans are very easy to grow. And um, my grandpa grew up, uh, or I grew up, and my grandpa always worked on a farm, and he grew soybeans. And uh, they, you know, grow quickly. It has a good harvest. And so then they, uh, they store really nicely as well. And then they're made into oil really easily. And then those are sold to manufacturing companies that use it because it's cheaper and easier to get. And they, they, that's what they use to manufacture foods. Um, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. So again, those sources, that linoleic acid is most prevalent in polyunsaturated fat, uh, PUFA, fatty acids, sorry, in the food supply. So those are going to be your cottonseed, soybean, corn, uh, corn oils, provide the most of those polyunsaturated fats, uh, fatty acids. Um, those food sources are nuts and seeds. So um, I, I kind of think it's a good idea to kind of skip the manufacturer. If you just go back to that whole food, um, usually you'll you'll be a little healthier if, if you just eat the whole thing. Um, long chain omega-3 fatty acids provided from seafood and from fatty fish. 
only animal products contain cholesterol. They're not found in egg whites or plant foods. So the places you can find the highest amounts of cholesterol um, that if you're watching your cholesterol, you probably want to uh, avoid would be in egg yolks, in liver, and in organ meats, probably because that's where we also store a lot of our cholesterol. And then, well, not in our egg yolks, <laughs> the no. average amount of cholesterol intake in the U.S. is slightly above 300 milligrams. Um, I think it's pretty funny because um, this is on page 109, and it says that it's slightly above 300 milligrams. And then it says this amount is felt to be in a healthy range. I don't know about you guys, but I care about science and evidence-based research uh, and evidence-based research doesn't come out with sentences like felt to be in a healthy range. Uh, I don't uh, don't want anyone to feel their way to giving me recommendations. I, I want them to uh, do the research and then come back with either conclusive or inconclusive. That's totally okay. But don't, uh, don't feel um, like things. Okay, so food choices. The percentage of fat by weight is widely used on food level labels, which is kind of misleading. So when we look at like maybe whole fat milk, it's going to say that 3.25% is the amount of fat that's in that food. But it's actually 48% of the total calories that's in that food. So when we look at it, we say, oh, well, it's only 3.25% of uh, fat. Well, it's not. 3.25% isn't the amount of fat in the milk, right? It has, it's 48% fat. 3.25 is the amount of fat that a person with a 2000 calorie diet could consume. So that whatever serving is going to be 3.25% of your daily fat consumption, not the milk. So it can be really difficult to figure out, is this actually a high fat food or not? And then marketing comes in and, and markets certain things that may or may not be true for the individual. So it's kind of hard to, to determine this stuff. Um, the nutrition facts label on foods will indicate the grams and the percent daily value for fat, saturated fat, and trans fat in a serving. I'm sorry. I'm not starting the slide over. Uh, the key to knowing whether the product contains any trans fat is of course just to read the ingredient label uh, because sometimes if there's less than 0.5 grams in that food, they don't have to put it on there at all. Um, and then for most people, a decrease in red meat consumption is probably desirable, but complete elimination isn't truly necessary. So uh, you don't have to completely get rid of animal products because you don't want to have any cholesterol whatsoever. That's not the recommendation. It's just to reduce. Overconsumption and the health related problems that come from overconsumption. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like the leading cause of death in the United States is cardiovascular disease. Um, and does it is it, is it really getting the, the hype that it's supposed to? I, I don't know. So uh, as far as your book, it gives it like a page worth of, uh, of the leading causes of death. And um, I don't think it's enough. So uh, first up is obesity. Um, so eating more fats will lead to excessive fat stores. And that's a common disorder. Um, blood lipid levels, which is hyperlipidemia. A lot of us are seeing patients and we're seeing that um, patients take anti-cholesterol medications, right? Anti-lipidemia. And so that is trying to help reduce those blood lipids uh, because eating a lot of fat in the diet, eating a lot of poly, uh, not poly, um, saturated fatty acids in our diet is going to elevate that blood lipid um, and it's going to raise our cholesterol, but most importantly, that low density lipoprotein cholesterol, the LDL, those stuff we don't want. And then the other thing is going to be cancer. So they are researching that there is a possible, um, at, I mean, probable link from that high fat diet to getting cancer, but um, they need more research. Uh, there is a relatively new industrial process that is used to uh, 
produce customized fats. They're called this interestified fat. Um, it's kind of the idea of mixing a hydrogenated fat with a unsaturated fat, right? And the idea is that they no longer have to say they're fat, they're trans fats, right? But they kind of are trans fats. The reason companies do this is because they want a longer shelf life for their products. And so they they do this thing. They don't, they don't, I mean, I don't think that any company out there is like, I'm gonna make people unhealthy. I want to make people fatter and sicker, right? Nobody's doing that. That's no nobody's saying that. Um, but what is happening is that they're trying to make more money. They're trying to create foods that last longer. And in doing so, it's making people unhealthy. So um, when they came out with all the marketing that trans fats were bad for you, companies had to take a different approach, right? Because suddenly people don't want to buy trans fats products and trans fats products last a long time. So uh, they have to come up with something new. Uh, so they're doing this interestified, <laughs> I think it sounds interesting, right? Um, and they could very well have a negative effect on the blood lipids but not as severe as trans fats, right? Because it, it does have some of that unsaturated fat. Uh, but either way, they're gonna research it some more. Um, the other thing here too is gonna be coconut oil that they talk about. Um, coconut oil got kind of touted for being like this amazing miracle thing. Um, anytime you know they say it cures many things all at one time, you, you gotta be suspicious. So um, they came out you know, saying that coconut oil would, um, let me find it in the section. Um, it would protect against cancer. It would like melt away excess body fat. But uh, I remember when people were like swishing coconut oil around in their mouths because they thought it was like, antimicrobial and it would whiten their teeth and just all this amazing stuff right you could like completely get rid of your gum seeds it was it's ridiculous so um the idea that it's just gonna miraculously get rid of things is uh, a little bit uh naive and um so they they've done a lot of research and studies and uh eating the whole coconut product so eating like coconut flesh and drinking coconut milk doesn't typically have too harmful effects but um, consuming processed coconut oil will consistently raise cholesterol levels. Um, so you want to be careful about that. Um, coconut oil falls into the fats range because it is solid at room temperature. So uh, you want to limit that. So as far as under consumption goes of fats, uh, we don't really have this problem here in the United States. Um, unless there is some kind of medical or uh, some, some other situation. So people who have like cystic fibrosis or people who are in kind of that late stages of, of AIDS where they can't absorb things, then they could very well run into this problem. An EFA or uh, essential fatty acids deficiency will result in poor growth, dermatitis, reduced resistance to infection and poor reproductive capacity. So kind of uh, new on the market are gonna be fat replacers. There are numerous foods that are getting manufactured that will contain less fat. I think that recreating food that has a lot of fat in it and, ha and, and then remarketing it having less fat is a good thing. I don't think it it should be touted as tasting just as good i think that people should kind of expect and then you know be okay with the fact that foods that don't have as much fat shouldn't taste as good as you know foods that do have more fat and and that's just you know something you you have to live with um this slide does refer you to table 6.5 for those fat replacers. You can see it at the bottom of page 114 and the top of page 115. Um, and they come from usually carbohydrates or proteins, um, and they sort of restructure them to uh, replace the fat in certain foods. Um, so by substituting fat replacers for fats, you can reduce that overall total fat um, and the idea is that people will lose weight, 
Um, again, you know, you deal with that um, complementary issue where, you know, someone will eat something that has low fat in it and then they'll just go eat an item that is full fat. So you have to be careful with things like that. Um, the book talks about uh, reducing your total fat uh, consumption by having maybe a low calorie salad dressing or replacing your like margarine or mayonnaise with like a fat free yogurt um, and things like that. They are adding those. Uh, the Some of these are made from modified starches and gums, by the way. So that is the end of chapter six. Um, let me know if you have any questions.